We will start. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining from. Um, this is the data visualization webinar series, and we're focusing on accessibility this morning. Um, so I see some chat in here. Um, hi, Keon. Good morning. Oh, it's good that you're safely working from home. And thank you. Jo oh, John James, how are you? Uh, good, to hear, good to see you here. Um, South Sudan, State of Palestine, great. Hi, Shini. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I'm Tomiko. I work in the data comms, uh, data communications team in DAPA. I'm actually on the stretch assignment right now in Caroline's team. And uh, I'll be presenting on accessibility and data visualization today. And I have a few colleagues here with me who will be also presenting and also helping me through uh, answering some of the questions you may have. Um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Fernando. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Fernando Botelho. I'm Program Specialist for Assistive Technology. I work with the disability section in New York in the, in the um, in program group. Um, so I've been asked to share with you, I happen to be blind. And so I use the computer with what we call a screen reader, which is basically a software that allows me to listen to what's on the screen. And uh, for somebody like myself, the way pages and documents, web pages and documents in general are designed makes a big, big difference because it allows, depending on how it's designed, it may allow or not uh, for my screen reading software to verbalize, to read out loud the contents that I need to, uh, to, to access. So I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, let me see. Ah, you cannot start screen share while the other participants are sharing. So one. Yeah, sorry, somebody... go ahead. You should be okay. able to know. Okay, so let me try that again. Okay, so you should hear a weird noise, which is my the speech. Do you? Can no, you confirm? No, we don't hear. We don't hear it, Fernando. Ah. That's funny. That's... I'll try that again. So, okay, checked. You have to have it to check. Okay. Okay. Now it should work. Yeah. Can you hear? Screen participants cannot see your screen. Screen sharing meeting controls window. Top channel, best button. Can you hear the, the yes, speech? Yes, you hear it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is the volume a little bit. Volume a little bit. Volume a little bit. Rate with Tom. And reduce the speed. Rate 20. Rate 5. Screen sharing meeting controls. Screen sharing meeting controls. Screen sharing meeting controls. So uh, perhaps this is not the highest quality voice. I should uh, NVDA menu. put a, a synthesizer. References to the menu. Can you text? Uh, References to the menu. That is a settings. little S. easier to understand. Speech dictionary to settings. S. Speech dictionary to menu settings. S. Uh, so I'm going to do that settings. now. General normal configuration dialog. Speech to 15. Speech property page. Change. Button alt page. Press. Select synthesizer dialog. Synthesizer. Combo box 60 can be collapsed. Alt This is good. You get to see. Microsoft speech API version. Windows 1 core voices. Windows 1 core voices. You get to see. NVDA settings, speech, normal configuration, go. dialog. You get to see speech both property a page, quality speech synthesizer, synthesizer grouping, which is the voice change. that verbalizes the content, and the more robotic From sound that I drew. showed earlier. NVDA settings. So this is the settings. So I'm going to. Edit read only categories, list, speech 2 of 15. Zoom, you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Window. Zoom, you cannot. OK button. Webinar on data visualization and. OK. So. Webinar on data. Webinar. Microsoft Excel with NVDA and. I'm going to open up a document. This Mozilla is an HTML Firefox. document. And the idea here is to show you Microsoft how Microsoft Excel with NVDA. Heading level one Microsoft Excel. Uh, it's, it's speaking slowly so that. Release uh, date. Everybody's able to understand. So 
the interesting thing about uh, switching from a visual way of accessing information to an auditory way is that when you look at the document and you're sighted, your eye can jump directly onto the item that you're most interested in. So you don't read from beginning to end. You just, your eye goes directly to the title or perhaps a graph or a photograph, and you jump around very quickly and efficiently. But for somebody such as myself, who is blind, Separator. the access has to happen serially. So I can start, I have a, a few options, right? I can go to the top of the document. Heading level one, Microsoft Excel with NVDA. Microsoft Excel with NVDA. NVDA is the name of the screen reading software I use, by the way. So I can go to the top and start from the top and just tell it to read straight through. So let me do that. Heading level one, Microsoft Excel with NVDA. Release date, June 12th, 2017. Separator. Heading level two, table of contents. List with 10 items, link one, introduction list with three items, link 1.1. What is Microsoft Excel? So I just stopped it. As you can see, it's, it's a slow process because let's assume I want to learn about how to uh, set up formulas on Excel. Uh, here I have to go and, and listen to everything from the title to uh, the table of contents and everything. And when you think about that kind of documents we read all the time at UNICEF, you know, 50 page documents, 100 page documents, uh, this would make it impossible for me to keep up with all the work I, I need to get done. So the secret to doing this efficiently is to design things not just accessible in the sense of being able to read the words, but accessible in the structure of the documents. So in addition to having the words available for me to read, which is, by the way, not something I can take for granted because sometimes people share images of words rather than the actual words uh, that are copy pasted. Sometimes they have an image of a word next to a, a photograph and, and so forth that they share on Instagram or or whatever it might be. Uh, but you know, assuming we have normal words available uh, as you would use in the body of an email message or a, a Word document, uh, you also need to have structure. So ideally, I want to know what words are the title of the document or a subtitle. So when I'm in a document like this one and I'm at the very top, out of list, out of list, heading level one, Microsoft Excel with NVDA. So you heard it saying heading level one. Uh, heading level one, Microsoft Excel with Microsoft NVDA. Microsoft Excel with NVDA. So that means that that's a header, a heading, and I can jump to it easily from any place in the document. I can be here. Heading level one. At the top of the, uh, the bottom of the document, I can jump up to the first level one header, uh, heading. Microsoft Excel with NVDA heading level one. And this ability to jump around is incredibly valuable because I can now go to the next, let's say, heading level two. Table of contents heading. It says it's a table of context. Copyright notice heading. Then copyright. One introduction heading. There you go. Introduction. Two getting started with Getting it. started. Three Excel essential. Excel essential. Four working with worksheets working heading with level. Worksheets. I can quickly jump around in the document and get to, to whatever I need to learn. Uh, this can happen not just in an HTML document, but this can happen in a PDF, uh, docx document, any normal, you know, quote unquote normal documents these days will have the ability of having uh, designated headings, links, tables, uh, and other objects that I can navigate to very efficiently. So what else can I show you? I guess uh, we can uh, Heading level. also show you list with that 10 I can items quickly one. jump to links. List with three items, 1.1, 1 .1. what is Microsoft Excel? What is link? What, what is Microsoft Excel? That's a link. This, this link, it's an internal link to this document. It will just jump to that section of the document, but it could be a link anywhere else on the internet. Um, I can jump to the next table. No next table. No next table, there is no table. No previous table. No previous table, there is no table in this document. So that's good to know. Um, and I would not be able to, to jump around like this if the document was just flat text. In other words, if it was just words 
and uh, without any kind of um, uh, classification or tagging. The, the best terminology Alert. is just tagging. From a torrent showed Ibexoda to everyone. By the way, uh, whenever I, a message is sent, and this, I don't know if that message, I silenced the screen reader, if that message was from my previous meeting, which I had to leave halfway through, or if it's somebody in this meeting, then my screen reader verbalizes the message coming in. And depending on what I'm doing, I have to silence it so I'm able to focus on what I'm doing. So I think we'll have lots of opportunity to, to answer questions. But this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to give you a sense of how it is uh, for me, or for anybody who is blind, uh, to be able to access the computer. We need to have structure so that we can be efficient in the way we consume information, and we need to have accessibility. So for example, if there was an image here, instead of a subtitle of a chapter. Copyright uh, notice heading level two. I could. One uh, introduction. To getting started with Excel. Getting started with Excel. If there was an image here and it was not labeled properly, it was not tagged properly, uh, I would hear something like file006.jpg, which is the name of the photograph being shared, instead of actual wording saying, you know, photograph of a uh, red car. Um, so whatever it might be. So all those uh, small elements that for you might look like they are minor details, for somebody who is blind and needs the accessibility, they make a tremendous difference. So I'm going to switch back. Webinar on data vision. Webinar and on data. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm available to answer any questions. Pains. Explorer. Thank you, Fernando. Sure. Did my uh, screen sharing stop? Uh, I don't think it sh stopped. Ah, okay. So Microsoft Excel with NVDA Mozilla screen sharing meeting. Ah, screen there you go. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll have Q and A at the end, and you can ask all your questions um, about screen reading software or how Fernando um, goes about accessing content on the web. So let me, can you guys see my screen? It's in full screen mode. Okay. Um, so with that, I want to start my presentation on um, accessibility in data visualization. And sorry, the order of things got switched a little bit, but um, so let's start with very basics. What is accessibility? And this isn't just about accessibility and data visualization, but accessibility in general. It's um, it's a practice of ensuring that as many people as possible can use, understand, and have access to a technology, infrastructure, tool, product, or service. And why is that important? Why does that matter? Um, and this might be, you know, kind of a dumb question, self-explanatory, but WHO estimates that about 1.3 billion people experience significant disability. Um, and I don't know what they mean by significant disability, but this is about 16% of the world's population or one in six of us. And when we consider temporary disabilities, most of us will experience some forms of disability during our lifetime, especially as we age. So maybe one day you break your leg or um, you get an eye infection and can see through one eye, you know, or you may develop arthritis as you get older, that kind of things. And also accessibility is not just for people with disabilities. Um, it benefits everyone. And when you hear, um, when you hear the word web accessibility, you may, um, you may think about the, web accessibility standards, especially uh, audience today may be more familiar with the web accessibility standards that's been around for a while. Um, and the Worldwide Web Consortium, also known as W3C, develops international standards for the web. And the Web Accessibility Initiative develops standards and support materials to help people understand and implement accessibility on the web. But today uh, in this presentation, we will focus specifically on accessibility for data visualization. 
Um, so to be honest, I'm not an expert on accessibility and data visualization. I'm pretty familiar with the general web accessibility standards um, being part of the digital platforms team. Uh, I have studied and learned some stuff about general web accessibility, but for this presentation, to prepare for this presentation, I started to look into uh, specific accessibility for uh, data visualization and found this chartability and uh, concept of chartability. And it's a set of testable questions for ensuring that data visualizations, systems, and in interfaces are accessible. And while chartability includes many of the criteria in the web accessibility standards, it goes beyond compliance requirements in many ways. Um, chartability seeks to affirm Article 10 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRDP, uh, that every human being has the inherent right to life and parties shall take all necessary measures to ensure its effective enjoyment by persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. So I think enjoyment, the word enjoyment is the operative term here. Um, the UNCRDP com commits to and promotes making life not only accessible, but also enjoy enjoyable so that we're not just alive, but can also live our lives to the fullest. And this is the basic principle upon which chartability was developed. And it works, chartability works towards making inclusion, accessibility, and enjoyment possible for charts, graphs, and data experience. And before I move on, um, I want to mention that, you know, when we're talking about accessibility for, in data visualization, we need to think about making all data viz accessible, like charts in uh, PDF reports that we produce or uh, PowerPoint presentations. So for example, like what I'm doing right now, but my presentation today primarily focuses on accessibility in data visualizations on the web, on websites. Um, and some of the recommendations that I'm going to uh, mention can be globally applied to all data viz, um, regardless of format or domain, but some are uh, web specific. So I just want to mention that before moving forward. So how do we actually make inclusion, accessibility, and enjoyment possible for charts, graphs, and data experience? Um, so the, chart, the people who developed chartability uh, developed uh, this workbook, and it's a resource for high-level audit of your data experience design failures related to accessibility. And in this context, data experience could refer to a data visualization such as chart, graphs, plot, but also a model, uh, an, an algorithm, or a data-driven interface or system. And unlike a compliance audit uh, for like the web accessibility standards, it's meant to identify design failures. Um, generally, chartability approaches accessibility as a scale rather than a state. The accessibility level of DX or design experience is determined by how few failures it contains. And this workbook, um, its set of tests is very thorough. And it's actually, um, I've looked through it uh, and studied it, but it's actually very time consuming, to be honest, to go through all of them. And it's resource intensive, right? Um, and many of the tests that are, that are suggested in the workbook actually cannot be conducted by end users. Um, so if you're just a content creator on a web page using a content management system, some of the things that they suggest you do, uh, you can't really do, right? So um, in this presentation, I'm only going to share a few of the uh, suggestions or recommendations uh, mentioned in this workbook um, that, can be, um, that can be implemented by users who are creating data visualization on the web using a content management system like Drupal or WordPress. So one first test is to um, ensure adequate color contrast. And um, color contrast, it ensures that people with low vision or color blindness can distinguish each element in a chart. And 
it can be tested by checking the contrast between the color of object and the background, as well as be in between the objects. So here in this test chart on the right side, uh, you should test um, the color contrast between all these five colors against the background, the white background, but also between these colors, right? If, if these colors have enough contrast. Um, the color contrast test is part of the general web accessibility standards and can easily be tested using online tools. Nowadays, there are a lot of tools that you can find, free tools online that you can use to test. So um, I've listed some of the tools here, but just as an example, I'm showing the screenshots here is, um, I think I used uh, this first tool, top, top tool, colorblind web page filter to test this chart to see what it would look like for someone who is completely colorblind. So someone who can only see in grayscale, um, you can see the, the difference between these colors is so subtle and also against the white color, uh, white background that it probably isn't, the color uh, contrast probably isn't sufficient to pass the test. The next recommendation is to provide title, summary, context, or caption. And you have to provide these um, title, summary, context, or caption that is sufficiently descriptive. And this is sort of, you know, open to a uh, wide interpretations, but I'm pretty sure the title test chart that I used for the, the this uh, sample chart doesn't pass this test. Um, so it should be something more descriptive like sample horizontal stack bar chart for data visualization webinar. So it should be self-explanatory and one doesn't have to guess what this chart is about. Um, and for the summary of context, um, for the, a chart embedded onto a web page, it can be part of the text on the page rather than the chart itself. But if a chart is sort of a standalone chart that's available on the web, all the summary and context should also be included in the chart so that one can access them. And the next uh, recommendation is uh, provide interaction cues. So for charts that have any interactive capabilities, it add instructions for users to understand how, it, how the interactivity works. Um, so here in this sample map, um, I included a cue that says hover over each country to see its ratio. So the map offers maternal mortality ratio. And if you hover over, this is just a static image, so you can't really see the interactivity here. But if you hover over, you should see the maternal mortality ratio for a partic for the particular country you're hovering over, right? And nowadays, interactivity of this kind may be very common. And um, for some people, it might be almost like second nature to hover over things like this. But even if it's a very simple interactivity like this one, and it may be, it may seem obvious to you, uh, you should provide an explicit in instruction. Um, and also interaction cues can also be offered in the text on the page rather than uh, included in the chart itself. Because most commonly like a chart, like a map like this is embedded onto a web page, right? And there is like a narrative before and after the map. So you can in uh, include the, in interactive cue in that text rather than in the chart itself. Um, so this, uh, the next one is write an appropriate reading level. I think many of us, if not most of us at UNICEF is guilty of this because um, we tend to write in this sort of long and complex uh, sentences that sort of meander, right? Um, and, but the recommendation is all text should target a reading grade level of nine or lower. So this is a grade level in the United States. So in, in the US, a ninth grader is usually between the age of 14 and 15. So when you are writing, um, and I think this is very web specific, when you're writing um, anything that's available on a website, you should target this grade level. Um, and the general tips on writing more concisely uh, on the web is use shorter, simpler words. 
um, don't use technical words that are really difficult to understand or need um, specific expertise to understand and make sentences to the point. So don't, you know, we tend to write at UNICEF a very long sentences that are connected by multiple commas or hyphens or certain uh, clauses are wrapped in parentheses. So try to avoid those long sentences and use active voice uh, rather than passive voice and try to avoid adverbs and weakening phrases. So adverbs um, are helpful and um, it makes your sentence sound, I guess, more professional, but sometimes they are um, hindrance to people who might not have a higher reading level. Um, and then I found when I was researching for this webinar, I found this tool online that checks the reading level of your writing, which is really, um, <laughs> and I actually copied and pasted something that was on our website and it completely failed. So I think it's a good, um, you don't necessarily have to follow its uh, record, all of its recommendations, but I think it's good to sort of test your writing. And I also want to sort of mention uh, our internal resource, right? There's this excellent Yammer community, writers and editors community that you can follow. And they they cover, they tend to cover um, UN or UNICEF specific uh, writing styles because UNICEF does have um, a style book, right? Writing style book that sort of um, are, are rules of our writing. And it sort of covers a lot of that. So it's a really good community to follow and ask questions. Uh, it's monitored by a group of like excellent writers and editors, and they really give you good feedback about writing. So we'd be strongly encouraged to follow that community. The next one is uh, add alternative text. So Fernando mentioned during um, his demonstration of screen reading software, you know, if there is an image on a web page. Um, and if if, it, if the image has um, sort of non-descriptive title, it really doesn't help, right? For pe uh, people who are using screen reader to access content on the web page, so alternative text also helps in that. Um, alt text, uh, alternative text, also known as alt text or alt tag, are written descriptions added to images that convey the meaning of the visual. It is read by screen readers in place of images, allowing the content and function of the image to be accessible to those with visual or certain cognitive disabilities. It is displayed in place of the image in browsers if the image file is not loaded or when the user has chosen not to view the images. Uh, it also provides a semantic meaning and description to the images, which can be read by search engines or be used to later determine the content of the image from page context alone. So it's not just, you know, uh, just for people with visual impairments, um, but it also helps your page uh, perform well in, by search, in search engines. So it's very important. And so like this is um, an example on the right side, you can see an example of alt text um, for one of the images used on data.unicef.org. And it, in it, Alternative text should be very sort of short. It shouldn't be a long sentence. Um, it should be um, a short description of what the image is. So in this example, it says a smiling mother lying next to her newborn baby. So it can be like something as simple as that. And in this, uh, the adding alt, te alt text is also part of uh, general web accessibility standards criteria. And adding alt text to an image in content management system nowadays is fairly easy, right? Um, if you, I think many of you are Drupal users or WordPress users, you know it's really, uh, technically it's very easy to add alt text, but writing alt text takes some practice, just like writing any other form of uh, text. So to help you write um, a good, Alt text. I found this formula online. Um, I found this website called Writing Alt Text for Data Visualization, which is a good resource. So I encourage you to read through after the webinar. And the formula for um, good alt text for a data visualization is a chart type of type of data where reason for including chart. So that's the formula. 
and I try to write an alt text for this example bar chart here. Um, so the alt text for this chart is bar chart, a percentage of birth registration for children under five years of age by region, where the registration prevalence varies significantly across regions. And to be honest, I don't know how good this is. <laughs> Fernando, maybe you can tell me if I pass or fail this test. Um, but as you can see, I pretty much took from like the title, the summary of the chart itself, and you can sort of uh, create an alt text so that people who are accessing this chart with a screen reader can also get the gist of what this chart is about, right? Um, and that was all of my presentation on accessibility, but I listed all of the resources that I mentioned here and um, you can, and there is a lot to read through, to be honest, like especially like the chartability and the char chartability workbook, you can read through. Um, some parts can be technical, but I think it's very, very interesting to read through. And it really gives you a completely dis different perspective how to access the web content on the web page. So I think it's it will be really helpful uh, for anyone to uh, read through this. All right, thank you. Um, so I think before we go into q and I want to introduce Iyad, uh, who is working on Accessibility Help Desk, and he can tell, talk to us about what his team does and how we can uh, use this resource for our work. Go ahead, Iyad. Thank you, Tomiko. Can I share my screen? Okay. You can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so let me make it a full screen. So first I would like to introduce myself. I'm uh, Iyad Abudosh, I'm a digital accessibility expert uh, working in the digital accessibility help desk. Um, I'll be listing the uh, services that we provided. The, the, the digital accessibility help desk is launched recently by UNICEF in order to make the uh, digital services provided by UNICEF accessible for uh, all, all the uh, people, including people with disabilities. And also it, it's, it's launched to provide services for uh, people with disabilities if they need, for example, any technical support in terms of uh, helping them to, you know, access the digital services provided by UNICEF. So the uh, first service that we provide is technical support and guidance. And in that, we uh, provide two services. In the first, we provide uh, support for UNICEF employee and staff by helping them to uh, ensure that they are uh, providing the digital uh, solutions and also the documents that are accessible for for everyone and in the other hand we uh, uh, we help also uh, and provide support for uh, people with disabilities who are working at unicef to make sure that they are having the assistive technology that they need and also that the software that they are using is supporting uh, accessibility so they can use it effectively the other uh, service that we provide is training and capacity building. So uh, any unit at UNICEF, if they need any help in terms of training or capacity building and providing, you know, how they can improve the accessibility of their digital platform, uh, like, for example, assume that they have a mobile application or a website and they want to make sure that it's accessible, they can reach us and then we can help them and follow up with them and making sure that they understand accessibility and how they can improve the uh, uh, level of accessibility of the digital service provided. The third service that we provide is evaluation and auditing. So uh, in this kind of service, we 
uh, we can receive requests from uh, UNICEF uh, staff and employee regarding auditing or evaluation the accessibility of uh, platforms. Uh, so if if yeah, if you have, for example, again a mobile application or a website or a, even a document, a PDF document or uh, a video, and you would like to make sure that it's accessible before you publish it, then we will be um, ensuring that it has all the elements that satisfy the you know uh, the criteria of accessibility and also to make sure that it's accessible for all the audience raising awareness also so we we also provide uh, as i mentioned uh, a training session in these sessions also we we raise the awareness also we have some initiatives that we are working on to make sure that uh, the unicef staff and uh, employee they are aware of the uh, important of the uh, digital accessibility and to provide accessible solutions for for uh, uh, everyone at UNICEF. Now, here I listed the uh, accessibility standards that we follow. Actually, Tomiko and Fernando, they mentioned uh, these. So there's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and also there is Section 508. These are the famous accessibility standards, but also I would like to point to you some of the resources that we have here at UNICEF. So the first resource is the UNICEF guidance on production of accessible content in Office 365 and for the web. This document is available for everyone who's working at UNICEF and it can help you to make sure that the files that you are developing, Excel, PowerPoint, Word, even websites and PDFs, they are accessible. I'll be sharing that link for you uh, shortly. Uh, the, there is also an article that we, we had it recently about the uh, web accessibility, about the digital accessibility help desk and how you can contact us. Um, this is, by the way, the digital accessibility email in this slide, which is digital accessibility at unicef.org. So in case that you have, you know, any uh, accessibility issue that you would like us to help you with or if you would like us to provide you with a training uh, session or if there is any question related to accessibility please reach out and let us know we are here to help you thank you and i'll be sharing the links uh, on the chat thank you Ian. thank you um so i just realized fernando i forgot to mention vpass would you like to mention that i'm going to share screen um so that people can see um this is on the okay. sure can you see that go ahead so everybody well a lot of people may not have heard yet uh, about the disability inclusion policy and strategy the dpass so this is a policy and strategy document that was approved uh, last year, uh, the second half of last year, and launched this year, uh, which covers the approach that uh, UNICEF is going to take to make sure that both its operations and its programs are inclusive. And what do I mean by that? So from the operations side, we want to make sure that our organization is representative of all people. Uh, so the idea is that uh, staff uh, with, we will have staff with disabilities as well as staff uh, without uh, disabilities. And that enables us to do programming that is more uh, uh, inclusive so, so that all children are, are included in everything we do. And I think the key element in DPAS is the fact that it's a cross-sectoral approach. In other words, when you're trying to make sure that a student that has a disability can study together with all his or her colleagues that don't have a disability, uh, it's not enough to provide that child with a talking computer like what I use or a braille book or uh, a chair that is uh, adapted to his or her needs if the child has a physical disability. But it's, need, it's necessary, for example, for the teacher to be supported. It's necessary for the student to have a ramp, if it's somebody who uses a wheelchair, have a ramp to enter the school, have accessible wash facilities, uh, have accessible transportation to get to school, or at least a sidewalk 
that is passable and so forth. Uh, it's necessary that stigma and discrimination and not be uh, a factor because sometimes you have a situation where a child may have an assistive technology that he or she needs like eyeglasses or wheelchairs or white cane or whatever it might be and the child is is too afraid of bullying and other issues to even wear it. Um, so the cross-sector approach acknowledges the fact that we need to take into account all these elements so that the entire environment is inclusive. It's legislation, it's funding, it's training, it's technology, it's attitudes. Um, and the DPAS brings all of this together in a strategy to make our organization more inclusive and the programming to more inclusive. We already have a number of objectives, uh, key indicators in the strategic plan, but the DPAS covers 2022 to 2030. So the idea is to make our efforts be uh, systemic and also consistent across strategic plans and continuous so that we can achieve what we have set uh, ourselves to do. Um, this was developed over more than a year and a half or so of time with consultations throughout uh, UNICEF, consultations with donors, with governments, with organizations of persons with disabilities, with adolescents with disabilities, and so forth. So it's been a great effort, and we're very proud of it. UNICEF is already a leader among uh, United Nations agencies in how inclusive its programming is, and even how inclusive its own operations are. But these, uh, the DPAS will allow us to continue that leadership and break new ground. A lot of people, understand that we need to include everyone when we say that we will leave no child behind. However, it's not easy to do so, right? Everyone has a number of objectives to achieve. Uh, everyone has uh, limited resources and fairly complex uh, obstacles and challenges to face. So the idea with the DPAS is that we work together to accomplish all these goals. Uh, we all want to do these things, and we need to help uh, one another figure out how to do these things. And cross-sectoral is something that is fairly easy to say and explain, and it's not easy to implement. But we think that we have a very good uh, way forward. Each regional office is going to develop an action plan to implement the DPAS by the end of this year. And the disability section in New York and all our regional advisors are available to help us uh, join forces in this and, and figure it out together. So always feel free to get in touch with us uh, in New York or any of our regional office uh, advisors. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Um, and Tomiko, should I make a comment as well about the accessibility uh, presentation that you have sure, made? Sure, sure. As well as <laughs> yeah, yes. yes. So I think um, when you hear about digital accessibility for the first time, it feels a little bit overwhelming, right? Because it, it's a, a way of looking at documents and digital information in general that is new to you. And it may seem like impossible or extremely difficult to do. So I want to emphasize the fact that you don't need to have a perfectly accessible document for it to be extremely helpful to us, right? So sometimes uh, you may find that, well, you know, making tables accessible is something that I don't understand how to do or I'm concerned about. Well, there's a lot of documents that don't even have tables. So just having those head headings, the titles and subtitles and sub subtitles tagged as titles and subtitles, is already going to be incredibly helpful in the way uh, some of us navigate those documents. So don't stop uh, uh, the attempt of making it accessible just because you don't think the end result is going to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect for it to be very good. It will be very good with just a few, uh, a little bit of effort, just like you would do spell checking. There are resources on each application to do accessibility checking and offer you some guidance. And of course, the Digital Accessibility Help Desk is there to help you. 
and uh, and guide you through through that process. Uh, and finally, on the alt tags, the the description of graphs and images and so forth. I thought your description was great, Tomiko. And uh, I think my guidance in that regard is that it's nice to be concise and direct. And just keep in mind the type of product you're making accessible, right? So if it's a children's book, uh, for example, and there's an image of a child playing with a toy horse uh, or, or a girl playing with a doll, in that context, it might be important to mention some details, like the doll is wearing you know, a red dress or whatever. So it might be uh, helpful to be a little more lengthy in the description, not no need to get carried away. But um, uh, if it is something uh, with an adult audience in mind, or if it's something fairly de decorative, so for example, the photograph of the ED meeting with a uh, child who is in a wheelchair, well, you don't need much more than that to describe that photograph because we don't need to know uh, what clothes they are wearing. We don't need to know all these other details. It, it's it's perfectly fine to be fairly concise in that description. And then, of course, if it's a book about art and impressionistic paintings, uh, that's different. You need more information to, to get the full benefit there. I talk too much, so I'm stopping right here. <laughs> no, Fernando, this is all really helpful. Thank you. Um, but I think considering the time, I want to move on to some of the questions that came in. Um, so the first question is, um, Kondej, uh, what about alt text for graphic or digital arts? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, you know, alt text, uh, adding alt text is a practice that uh, a guide, a uh, recommendation that should be practiced for um, any sort of graphics on the web, but for this presentation, I was primarily focusing on visualization. So I didn't mention that, but um, it should be uh, added for any sort of graphics or digital arts, absolutely. Um, and before I go on to the next question, I think people raised hands. Uh, so Sarab, could you put your question in Q&A because uh, attendees are muted, uh, so you can't really speak up. If you could put your question in Q&A, I can address them. Uh, and in the meantime, Iyad, you raise your hands. Yeah, thank you, Tomiko. I just want to follow up on Fernando's uh, point regarding you know, making the uh, documents or even platforms and uh, content accessible. Uh, as he mentioned, in many cases, from my experience, the awareness is the problem. So people will not will not know that there is something called accessibility, and they will not be uh, understanding how they can make things accessible. In uh, and and sometimes it will be pretty simple. For example, if I'm preparing a PowerPoint presentation, okay, how can I make that accessible before sending that to to the audience that that will be using that? For example, in 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 for example, in Microsoft. All the applications that we are using, there is a, a review uh, tab. In that tab, there is, uh, you know, uh, check accessibility. And then it will tell you if there is missing alternative text for images or if there is, for example, some structure that need to be added to the content and so on. And it will be also uh, helping you to improve the accessibility of the document before sending the document. Now, in some cases, especially because you talked about visualization, sometimes people will will just you know add the alternative text for the images just for the sake to uh, pass that kind of checking let's say and at the end it will not be beneficial for the uh, person with disability it's important as you mentioned you and fernando that make it descriptive so uh, it's not, it's not about passing the the testing with the tools but it's about making the the content accessible for the people so it it can provide more information for them so it can help them thank you Thank you, Iyad. Um, I think, so this this sort of relates to the next question from Shinny about hyperlinks. Um, she wants to ask about using hyperlinks on the web page. Uh, for example, when I write some text on a page and try to put a hyperlink to the text, what would be your recommendations? Would you recommend I write read here and link to the text here or write read more on the data visualization page and put the link to the text? Uh, data visualization page. Um, I think for this recommendation, this is a general web accessibility question, Chini. 
uh, but it's a good one. Um, I definitely vote for the second one. The contextual uh, linking is necessary. And this is also very common, uh, I feel, at UNICEF uh, on a web page or you know, in a document, click here. That is really a poorly written, uh, actually, text, in my opinion, because here it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, ideally, one should know what they're clicking into before clicking on the link. So give some context as to what the what the link will um, take them to, right? Um, so in, in this example that you gave, I vote for the second one definitely, and um, without making it too too long, but uh, definitely not read here or click here. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and Sarab, um, do you have guidelines for accessibility in mobile apps? Mm, I not that I know, but I can see. I can I can look into it and. Um, can I can I answer yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead, Ian. If you know, yes. Please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, following up to the to the previous question, you you your your answer is uh, actually uh, uh, great. But but I just want to add one more thing because Fernando said that the the content is serialized when you are using a screen reader. Now in many cases. The person who's using a screen reader will be going directly to the headings or to the links, and people don't know that. So if he's going directly to the to the list of links, then he can see that there is here or there is, uh, you know, click here. Then he will not understand what is the, as you mentioned, the context of that link, which is important to provide some context or the, you know, that the description you can say of that link. Another thing is uh, related to the mobile accessibility. Yes, the web con the the. The W3C, you know, the, the creators for the web content accessibility guidelines, they link the uh, guidelines uh, to mobile also. So they have uh, a draft of how these guidelines can be applied to mobile. But if you follow the, in my opinion, the web content accessibility guidelines, the, 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 these guidelines can be easily applicable also to, to mobile. For example, if I'm creating a mobile application and I'm having images there, I need to have alternative text for these images because if a user is using that application and it does not have alternative text, then there will be a problem and so on. So the things that we know from other apps, they are also in mobile. But in addition to that, there is also, you know, the, the sense of touch because many of the smartphones that we are using, they are using touch also. So there is some accessibility issues related to that as well. But there is a guidelines and I will send the link to the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. And um, we can also, I'm going to also include that all of the links that Iyad has uh, shared in the follow up email so that you have it in your email. Um, so the next question, or did you have anything else to add, Iyad? No, I think that, that that's it for now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question from Margareth, what about charts and other visualization pieces shared on social media? So Actually, social media team here at uh, New York HQ uh, has a social media accessibility guidelines. So you can, I can share that also in the follow-up email. But uh, as far as I know, Twitter nowadays makes it very obvious if an image has an alt text. Um, I don't know about the other platforms, but uh, you do, you can add alt text um, for images on social media. So there is a way to do that. And um, I'm, I'll definitely include the accessibility, social media accessibility guidelines as well. Okay, um, any other questions? Thank you, Yad, for that link. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, this has been a lot of, um, a lot of learnings, I think, for many of you, but this was really helpful for me. Definitely. Um, so thank you. Well, it's 10 o'clock in New York. It's at the hour. So maybe we can uh, finish up. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Oh, oh, I should mention. So I was I'm currently on the stretch assignment, but I'm here. I'm in the data communications team until the end of June. So this is the last session that I'm going to lead. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> sad to go, but uh, Anshana will be back. And but we will be taking a break next month. It's been a monthly uh, session up until now, but we will take a summer break uh, in July. But um, we'll 
and maybe in August too, uh, depending on the schedule, but um, I know many of you will also be going on uh, leave. So um, we won't see you for at least for two months, but thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Tomiko. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.